This episode was brought to you by Schedulicity. You're listening to episode 38 of the Connected Yoga Teacher podcast with today's guest, Trina Altman, who draws on years of study from all kinds of movement modalities, inspiring us to look at how we move and how we can prevent injury. I'm your host, Shannon Crow. I'm a mother of three. You heard one of my kids, Colton, at the intro. He introduced that this episode has been brought to you by Schedulicity. Thank you, Colton. It was bring your child to work day yesterday, and he he agreed to record that and I know he was a little reluctant because he said, mom, one thing I've learned today is that I don't want to be a podcaster. <laughs> so some of us like to be recording video or sound and some of us prefer not to be. Anyway, let me get back to what I was saying. I'm a mother of three, a yoga teacher and a consultant for yoga teachers. This podcast was inspired by the very first time I left a yoga teacher training. In my 200 hour yoga teacher training, I made some fantastic connections. I felt like I was really held accountable to my yoga practice and I was learning so much about myself and the roots of yoga. When we graduated, our group actually talked about getting together monthly, continuing with this journey of learning together. But in reality, we all went home to our own lives and our new yoga classes in our own communities. And so this left me feeling a bit like I'd been dropped off in the wilderness of yoga entrepreneurship. I was away from the constant feed of knowledge, the motivation to practice, and the learning and growing. Most of all, though, I was away from this supportive community of other yoga teachers. So fast forward to today. It's been over 11 years now since my very first yoga teacher training ended. And I still have so much to learn. I have so many questions. Questions about anatomy, accounting, philosophy, marketing. And so this podcast was born out of me wanting a place where I can feel supported every week as a yoga teacher, asking the questions, gaining knowledge, gaining inspiration, hearing stories, and really diving into some actionable steps. This podcast is a place for you, the yoga teacher, where you can hear from yoga teachers and other professionals between the classes, the workshops, and trainings that you are teaching or attending. Thank you for being here today, for being part of this. I'm so excited that you get to hear from Trina Altman. In 2012, a book was published called The Science of Yoga, The Risks and the Rewards, and It was written by William J. Broad, and shortly after that, there was a New York Times article, How Yoga Can Wreck Your Body, and I feel like it was really interesting timing. It was 2012 when it was published, and it opened up this conversation of maybe yoga can also be causing injuries, not just be bringing us all kinds of benefits. It ruffled a lot of feathers. It made some yoga teachers pretty upset. Personally, in my own life, it was really interesting timing because I'd just become a certified 500-hour yoga teacher, I had decided to really dive in and make this a full-time thing. And also I had just injured my rotator cuff and I couldn't do any more downward dog or a lot of other yoga poses. In talking with Trina, you're going to hear how she really shares her own injury story and how she decided to dig in and figure out how to move her own body. She worked one-on-one with yoga teachers and also you're going to hear her call it a physical therapist in Canada. We say physiotherapist. It's the same thing. And you'll really get to hear her story and kind of her thoughts around how we can be moving our students and our own bodies in ways to prevent injury. I would love to see a continuation of this topic following today's episode. So while you're listening or maybe after you've listened, go over to the connectedyogateacher.com and you'll see our join button right on the home page. You can join if you are a yoga teacher or if you are in your very first 200 hour yoga teacher training. We had a recent discussion about the crowdfunding episode with Maxine and really inviting in lots of different thoughts around that. And this week, Trevor Parks, who we heard from in episode 29 in his About Me page episode, Trevor shared in our private Facebook group over 150 playlists for yoga music. So if you're feeling like you need a little inspiration, a little boost, thank you so much for that, Trevor. It was a huge gift. And I know a lot of you have already said it was so well received. And then some others are sharing their playlists as well. Before we dive in and hear from Trina, let's hear our hot tip of the week from Schedulicity. 
Hello Connected Yoga Teachers. This is Megan with the Schedulicity Hot Tip of the Week. Online booking is so easy. One common concern is that clients may forget that they have booked with you. Your time is valuable, so we have tools to help you protect yourself from no-shows. You can enable text reminders for your clients in case they aren't checking their email regularly. You also can set up your offerings to be held with a credit card number, deposit, or full prepayment. Then you can create a no-show policy to let your clients know that they may be charged if they don't show up. Just as we can take measures to protect your body from injury, we can make moves to protect your schedule from no-shows. Thank you to the Schedulicity team. I'm so excited that we soon get to meet with the Schedulicity rock stars. If you could join us, we would love to have you there. It's Wednesday, November the 29th, and there are more details on our website. Go to theconnectedyogateacher.com, click on events to sign up. There are two amazing prize draws. One is a free consultation call with me, and the other is a lifetime subscription to Schedulicity. This is huge. I'm so excited. And And most important, we get to hang out, ask a lot of questions about online scheduling and how to set that up, what it's like to switch from another system, or maybe why manually doing this system is taking too much of your time in your yoga business. Okay, so let's dive in and hear from Trina Altman today. Trina is a yoga and Pilates teacher who's based in LA, but she does lots of traveling to teach and present at various conferences. She's also a yoga tune-up and role model method teacher trainer. She created Yoga Deconstructed and Pilates Deconstructed. These are both online and live courses. And Trina talks about while she was at Brown University, how she took a Kripalu yoga class and this really ignited her journey. I first met up with Trina through videos that she was sharing in Diane Bruni's yoga and movement research community. If you're not already a member and you really connect with today's message and kind of the information going out there, I'm going to put a link in the show note to Diane's group because I feel like there's a real conversation going on over there. And I also really appreciate that the group is open to questioning and really digging in. How can we prevent injuries and what have we been doing in the past as yoga teachers and how can we improve? Trina talks to us about how she took four and a half years away from taking any group classes. I think this is amazing. And where she focused more on taking reformer classes and therapeutic one-on-one yoga while she was also working with a physical therapist. I noticed that at the yoga studio where I work and with my own intake form, a lot of people, a lot of students will fill out the form and say that one of their main goals is flexibility. So this, there's no wonder why teachers are really focused on stretching and flexibility in their classes. And it wasn't until I did a lot of research in my own body and started working with the physiotherapist myself that I saw that I needed some more strengthening. One little note, if you're listening to this episode while you're driving or you're out in your garden, you might want to re-listen again when you can get down on the floor and roll around. It was funny when I was listening to and editing some of the audio, my partner Sean and I were kind of doing some of the movements that Trina talks about today. Trina also talked to us about private yoga classes versus group classes, and I'm excited to get into this a little bit more. Um, I'll be here at the end of the episode to do a little wrap up and key takeaways. There are a couple of things that I'm really going to add into my own yoga classes that I share, so I'm excited to talk to you about that at the end. So welcome to the Connected Yoga Teacher Podcast, Trina. It's great to have you here today. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. I feel like I barely know where to start with all of my questions. I have been a big fan watching some of the videos that you share and just the concepts that you share. And I'm excited that we get to talk a little bit more about why people are getting hurt doing yoga. That's a huge topic. Feels like it could take up many episodes. But let's just start. Where did your yoga journey begin? Do you remember your first yoga class? I do. Um, My very first yoga class was when I was in college. It was junior year and I was at Brown in uh, Providence, Rhode Island. And there was a teacher. I think we had the choice for our like gym requirement to to pick something. and And yoga was one of the things that we could pick. 
And I was like, oh, that might be fun. <laughs> there was a teacher, and she was a Kripalu teacher. And she came in and, and taught class, and I took class once a week. And I just loved it. It was very unstructured. Right. <laughs> and uh, she gave us permission to move in all kinds of ways, and the breathing, and the I think we did some sounding. And so, I mean, it was very brown. is kind of like the Berkeley of the East. So it was <laughs> appropriate, probably, for um, that demographic. I was a stressed out college college student and um, you know the typical outlets for that were uh, drinking or eating pizza late at night <laughs> and right. so it felt really good to do something besides those two things that helped with stress that was a you know kind of I grew up in Tulsa Oklahoma you know there just there wasn't a lot of you know more fringe types I mean yoga was very fringe right. back in 1993 I think right. <laughs> there weren't there weren't any yoga studios uh in Providence at that time even Do you that I was aware that of that Kripalu teacher's name I don't you know it was just a I think it was just one semester and it was once a week and I'm 45 now and I would have been I guess like 20 so that's 25 years ago <laughs> well I love it so that's what happens to your brain I guess when too much time passes uh I mean I remember all my teachers names that I studied with yeah but yeah it was just like um you know just a little drop in once a week class that I think it wasn't even like a full credit it was like a order of a credit or something like that yeah oh, nice I love it that you were as a college stressed out early 20s that that's where you found it because as you said that's where we really need it those are the times so you connected then with all of the benefits of yoga can you take us back to when you discovered like yoga can also cause injury to the body do you remember that moment or time after the class at Brown, I remember I bought the Patricia Walden Betamax thing because, you know, I wanted to practice on my own. And that was such a different experience. I think it was called Yoga for Flexibility. And so it was very structured and it was Iyengar and, you know, we were creating these shapes and stretching and, you know, and ranges of motion. And then when I moved to New York City in my late 20s, I started practicing Bikram yoga. A friend had just moved to New York City and she went to college in, in L.A. and was practicing Bikram there and took me to those classes. And again, it was wonderful stress release uh, from working super crazy long hours. And I, I worked as I was a fashion designer and jewelry designer in my 20s. But I didn't really, you know, I didn't have any experience with injury in my early 20s or even late 20s or even early 30s. I continued um, practicing Bikram. Bikram when I left New York and was in back to Tulsa, Oklahoma for a couple of years. And then when we, my husband and I, uh, boyfriend at the time, when I moved to Connecticut to be with him, I started practicing at a yoga studio for the first time that wasn't like a Bikram. <laughs> Right. Uh, I mean, I took I took a Shivananda class here and there in the East Village when I lived in New York in the 90s. But I actually became really good friends with this the owner of the studio because we were both taking a jewelry and metal methane class together. And even then, um, I was fine. Um, I think because it wasn't, you know, I was still in addition to taking, you know, maybe one. I couldn't afford to take more than like one or two yoga classes a week. And I had my gym membership and, and then I did my 200 hour training and I, I was pretty fine through that too. I think it started when I began teaching and taking a lot of flow classes. That was when, uh, and, and by that point I was probably in my mid to late thirties. Right. So I, I have a lot of hypermobility and, and I think, yeah, it just kind of took time too much stretching and and uh, not enough strength training. Yeah, and I think the flow was really, you know, the, the long periods of time of bearing weight on your wrists. So I, I started to, yeah, have a lot of pain, just mostly all in the right side of my body because um, I was, I think, just very, I had no awareness of all the body blind spots in my body and, and the places where I was just bypassing and, you know, overworking because of other places that were just very sort of sleepy and checked out. Yeah. So for myself, 
listening to your story, it's so amazing to hear you go through this progression. And I think a lot of us feel this way that we get into yoga because it makes us feel fantastic. And then we continue and we teach it. Then mm-hmm. there's a sort of shift of like, and it sounds like maybe you already were doing strength training, but in listening to you speak before, I've heard you talk about the real importance of strength training. Do you want to go into that a little bit? Yeah. I, I mean, what I, you know, just the way our society is and what we have to do to make a living these days, <laughs> unless you're lucky enough to teach movement um, on a regular basis like I am, is, is a whole lot of sitting, standing, and lying down sleeping. Um, and not a, not very much movement. And I think that most of the human population that lives in, you know, the countries where you work at a computer most of the day are very we, you know, not strong at all because we don't have to lift anything. <laughs> we don't have to push anything. We don't have to pull anything. We don't have to, you know, walk on uneven surfaces. Uh, and we love yoga just as I did because of the stress relief. It's that one movement modality um, besides Pilates that I think takes you more into the parasympathetic and the, the rest and digest as opposed to you know, say like the gym where you're doing cardio or weight training and it's a, it, that's more upregulating, which can be stress relief as well. But uh, the bias in yoga, you know, since it's, there's only so much you can do with a mat. Um, you know, there aren't really things that you can pull or push uh, because there's no equipment. Um, and so the, I guess the deconditioned body doesn't, you know, we just, we need the input has been my experience of some external load in order to just stay pain-free. Um, I found that for, for myself and for many, many of my students and then teachers that I've, you know, our students. Mm -hmm. I like how you bring that in because I know that there is sometimes this thought of yoga can fix everything and all on its own yoga is the thing to turn to, especially in the mentality of as a yoga teacher. I remember feeling that way, like, oh, you have this, try (sighs) yoga. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and and that's, um, you know, whenever you're a student and you're you're studying to become a teacher, I know for me, I mean, I'm just like a learning junkie. So I dive all in um, and immerse myself in whatever thing I'm, you know, all jazzed up about and excited to learn more about. And so, yeah, we, you know, at least when I did my 200 and 300 hour, it was as it should be, you know, required that you not just teach the work, but embody it and to have your own practice. I think the missing piece, though, was, you know, there was the practice every day. And it didn't have to be asana. It could have been, you know, pranayama or meditation or all of them. But what we do when we teach is asana for the most part. That's what people are interested in. Mm -hmm. So you end up practicing that the most because that's what you are teaching the most. And I think it's changing. I, 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 you know, I know some 200-hour yoga teacher trainers, and I know they're they're passing along the message of you know movement on the mat is wonderful but but again you, you know you're not lifting anything you're not pushing anything you're not pulling anything um you know it, there's a limit to uh what the benefits are for your physical body if this is you know sort of the only piece of your movement diet uh, you know, I love Katie Bowman because she came up with that great analogy of like, you know, kale's good for you, but if you only eat kale, you're going to die. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. And we all know ice cream is, tastes, you know, isn't that great for you. And if you only eat ice cream, you'll die. But it's the same, you know, it's the variety and, and the variability part of the puzzle that I think is, you know, people are figuring out, but it wasn't talked about or, or really understood for um at least quite a while while I was sort of, as they say, coming up as a yoga teacher. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And even as a yoga teacher, like there, if running a yoga business, I still find, like you said, that you're, you're really lucky. And I feel the same way that I get to move around. And, you know, even if I'm teaching, I can stand and talk but there's a lot of time where I'm sitting at my computer as well. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> yep. what, do you think the, what do you think a balanced personal practice looks like? Or what does even your own balanced personal practice look like? Not just yoga, uh, overall. Right. Oh, well, if you want to know what I do movement-wise each week, um, it's pretty, it's very varied. Uh, so I generally take my new thing is there's, um, a studio in the town adjacent to me that's called jumping fitness USA. (laughs) And 
I am just in love with uh, one of the teachers there. But it, we have our own trampoline, and they, they don't have springs. They have, like, elastics, and they're pretty big. And there's different classes. So there's, like, the jumping fitness, which is 55 minutes of jumping and, like, choreography, dance moves to music. And then there's jumping interval and jumping boot camp where you jump at the beginning, and then you do different types of, you know, exercises where it's, like, you know, squats or pulling stretchy bands or kettlebells. Uh, and then you do some jumping at the end. Um, so I do that. It will take a while. I do a lot of things. <laughs> I probably take about three reformer classes a week, Pilates reformer classes. Uh, I live in LA, so I would say within a 10-minute walk of my house, there's probably six Pilates apparatus space studios. <laughs> there's a lot going on here, which is, is nice. And then I also do a private uh, once every two weeks, uh, and the teacher is trained in gyrotonic, gyrokinesis, yamana body rolling, and Pilates. I generally will take like one yoga class a week and it depends. Sometimes it's a flow class. Uh, sometimes it's, there's a teacher at the moving joint that I really like that I always tease her. I say you teach real yoga because we do, um, we don't just do asana and, and she's also a, a psychotherapist. So she, she brilliantly introduces, I think a lot of emotional intelligence and connection in the class, but we do crazy things too, you know, like the Kripalu style and, you know, yell and make sound and do a little free form movement in addition to, you know, the restorative and the asana and the pranayama. Um, and then I work with a personal trainer once a week doing weight training. And then I do some weight training on my own, usually uh, once a week. Um, and I take classes at the moving joint and I, I, I take, there's a couple, um, there's a dance two dance classes that I take at, at Equinox that I just absolutely love. They're like follow along, you know, boogie down, pretend that you are. I always tease because I was never a dancer. And so my friends are like, I don't know if I can come, you know, I'm not a very good dancer. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 this is what you do. <laughs> you watch the teacher the whole time because I have to to follow along or I, I won't know what I'm doing. And in your mind, you are dancing in the exact same way they are dancing. <laughs> um, yeah. And, uh, but like, you know, last night I took a gyrotonic tower class. Um, so I do really, uh, switch things up a lot and I, and I sample, there's another class I take at Equinox. It's called body challenge where we do like sand bells and, um, you know, BOSU and, uh, like step ups and, um, there's this thing called the Viper and then we do a kettlebell. So I do really, um, you know, I'm a multidisciplinary teacher in the sense that I, I draw from, you know, everything that I'm learning and doing yeah. in my own movement practice. I love it. Yeah. I love it that it's not just yoga that you're pulling from. <laughs> Now, when you go to all of those classes, do you ever sit there and go, I'm not doing that movement because in your mind, you know, okay, that, that is not, this is not movement that is too friendly to the body with all of your knowledge. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, so it took, it took me about, I'd say four and a half years of actually never taking group classes because I couldn't because I was so injured and I didn't know enough to know what I should do, what I shouldn't do, you know, what I uh, could do and what I couldn't do. Um, and so that was, you know, all learning, learning in private. So instead of taking a private, you know, once every two weeks, I was taking privates, you know, every week. And I was doing a lot of physical therapy and, um, you know, just tons of taking trainings and studying. And, uh, you know, I would go to physical therapy sometimes and just bring stacks of books and papers that I had written questions about anatomy. To your physical therapist? Yes, yes. And I just pay him out of pocket, you know. Um, and same thing with my private instructor, you know. I would uh, take a class and say, okay, this is what we, and I would do this with my PT. I'd say, okay, you know, I took this class yesterday and they had us doing this. Will you watch me do it and let me know if I'm ready for it right now or not? And then if I am, if I'm doing it in a way that's sustainable. So the, the reason why I'm able to take all the classes that I take now is because uh, I often say this, you know, I'm the boss of my body and I'm a good boss. 
but it took me many, many years to be a good boss of my body and a lot of learning. <laughs> right. So you were just following along with the group or, as you said, feeling like four and a half years is a long time to be out of group classes. Yeah, I was taking yoga tune-up classes because I, you know, and, and reformer classes um, because I, you know, that's what I know very well from studying and having to certify and take tests and, you know, mm-hmm. uh, all of the rigor of that. But anything outside of those two realms of like apparatus-based Pilates or, um, you know, very therapeutic yoga, I wasn't taking any classes. Um, so, yeah, I, I knew, you know, I, I began to understand the concept of, uh, of load and graded exposure and And, um, you know, just this idea of everybody's body is different and also everybody's body is different depending on the day (laughs) Um, or your stress levels Uh, because the group fitness paradigm, whether it means to or not, sends a message that we're all here in this group doing the same exact thing, right? right? Which it's it's a wonderful format. I, I love it. I mean, I would say... Whenever I, the the few times that we travel, like we were in Greece and I'm not here um, in the States to like do all of these group classes or, you know, even when I wasn't taking a a ton of group classes, you know, not able to do private sessions or, or whatever, uh, I miss it. Um, I, uh, I mean, I like nature, don't get me wrong, but I'm not one of those people who's like, oh yeah, I can just, you know, well, I can just go for a hike and that's fine. Right. And I like the social, um, the social interaction in the community that of, I mean, I tease again sometimes, but like. I'm pretty much an, an atheist, but I think of like the gym and the Pilates studio and the yoga studio are, are kind of like our modern churches right. in the sense that, uh, I mean, hopefully they're not dogmatic, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> some are and some are, but they are where you go and things are kind of stripped down. Like it's not a party where you put on your makeup and do your hair and have your cutest outfit. Although I'm sure there are places, gyms like that, um, <laughs> <and> studios <laughs> like, but you know, it is, it's, you know, you, you just kind of show up and you're there to not do all of the sort of posturing that's required in your professional life or in your, you know, uh, I guess, social, social life, right. maybe, maybe your dressed up social life, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. so interesting. Such an interesting take on it. If there are yoga teachers who are kind of like me out in the boonies, I mean, for me to drive to a yoga class takes 10 or 20 minutes. <clears throat> yes. And then, uh, I'm a little bit afraid of the gym. No, I'm a lot afraid of the gym. <laughs> So is there, is there anything that teachers can be doing in their own personal practice to do this, the movements that we're not getting, this lift, push, pull, walking on an uneven ground is pretty easy to find out in the boonies. Yes. <laughs> but the push, pull, lift. Um, Yeah, I mean, so I've only lived in Los Angeles for seven years. Before that, we were in Iowa for one year, and then we were in Milwaukee for six months, and uh, then we were in Connecticut and and Oklahoma. I grew up in Oklahoma, so I definitely understand the boonies thing. Um, (laughs) And I would say that I'm I'm very resourceful, and uh, that even before the internet, you know, I would go. I would go to the library and like check out every single book on you know yoga and Pilates and read them and like photocopy the sequences out of the back and take them home and try to do them. But nowadays, you know, and then when DVDs came out, I'd, I bought all the DVDs. I would do them. And then there was this thing called Fitness TV um, that I was, that was probably like in the early 2000s. So I did a lot of that, especially when I lived in snowy places and you couldn't even drive to, you know, the gym if you wanted to. And, and I think it was really, I, I, they're wonderful resources because you can press pause, you know, and if the person is like, okay, grab your, you know, eight pound dumbbells, you can grab your three pound dumbbells if it feels like too much. Um, you know, if the person is doing like plyometric lunge switches, you know, you can be like, oh, that's great, but mm, I'm going to do just like lunge, step forward, lunge, step back. (laughs) And, and there's none of the like, 
because uh, I know, I mean, by the time you're my age, you don't care anymore, I think. I, you know, like, I don't care if I'm doing something totally different in a group class. I'll tell the teacher, you know, don't worry, I won't distract. I'll be in the back. But, like, you know, <laughs> if I'm not doing what you're saying, it's not because I'm not listening to right. you. <laughs> um, but when you're home, if you're doing online things or video things, you you know, there's there's not that pressure at all if you do feel awkward or weird about doing something different. Um, what are some of the things that you take out of a traditional yoga class, say? Um, <laughs> well, it's probably better if I describe to you how I teach yoga yeah, for <laughs> yeah, sure. because, uh, because it's not very traditional at all. Um, so because I pull from so many different movement modalities and my goal is less about, um, you know, I, People, of course, either love or hate my class, and and my my class is is top down and bottom up, meaning top down like it's it's there's the cognitive sort of logical brain part that I'm going to ask of you, I, I'm going to ask you to bring your logical you know critical thinking mind on board, but I will also ask you to do bottom up, meaning um, you know bringing awareness to your body without being overly concerned with performance, uh, you know, understanding the under layers of, of what we're doing um, and being able to sort of track. Um, I mean, tracking is a term they use in somatic psychotherapy uh, to, but it's very similar to interoception, um, but, you know, proprioceptive and interocepting while while you're in my class. So I generally start with um, therapy ball rolling because there's always a theme to my class. So say the theme is, and the theme's always a skill, if the theme's like cross patterning, um, then maybe we'll take the ball and try to trace the perimeter of our right shoulder blade um, by wiggling around and moving on the floor, you know, navigating that ball around the, those prominences. And I'll poke my shoulder blade out and show it to them and say, look, here's the bottom tip, you know, here's the medial border. And then we'll take the a ball or two and roll it on. So if we do right scapula, then we would do like left scapula and right buttock. So that they're uh, creating sort of an internal portrait of the back body because that's hard for people to map because it's behind them um but it from a sensorial perspective and and then the rest then i would move into some feldenkrais exercises for cross patterning and uh i mean for me the balls are just you know a way for a lot of times people don't have a ton of patience for the feldenkrais work so i get more feldenkrais work in because if they have a ball underneath them while they're doing those movements, then they feel like they're checking something off their to-do list. <laughs> you know? Can you tell us what the Feldenkrais work is? I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Um, Moshe Feldenkrais is, gosh, well, if you are certified to teach Feldenkrais, which I'm not, it's a four-year program, like a university program. So I've just taken once weekly Feldenkrais awareness through movement classes for probably like three or four years, but I am not a Feldenkrais, you know, uh, licensed practitioner or teacher. Okay. Uh, but the way it works is it, it definitely is working with your nervous system. And if you take a class, uh, there there's a theme um, and you do lots of very small movements that lead into bigger movements. And there's usually um, a movement that you'll check in with at the beginning of class and a movement you'll check in with at the end of class and notice how it, how different it feels in the beginning versus at the end um, and, and how it feels so different just from doing these little tiny movements okay, so then over you the course of an hour. Pull in something similar to that in yours. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, gosh, it's so hard to describe movement, right? <laughs> Verbally is. over the. But like, say you're lying on the floor and your knees are bent, and you place your palms together like a prayer, and your elbows are straight, and your palms are right above your sternum. Um, and then I say, okay, rotate your rib cage to the right, and rotate your rib cage to the left. Well, people are going to do all kinds of things, right? Mm -hmm. They will just just move their arms and not their rib cage. <laughs> or they'll just bend their elbows, um, or they will actually move their rib cage, or they'll move their rib cage and roll across their hips and let their legs, you know, fall from side to side. So 
I will, like, say if I'm going to teach Parvita Parjva Konasana, I'll cue them and say, okay, the only rule right now is that you can't bend your elbows, right? Or the only rule right now is your hands must stay directly above your sternum. So I'm cueing them in a way to uh, facilitate thoracic rotation, but for them to, to feel also what it's not, that it's not moving your arm, you know, that it's not swaying your legs from side to side. Right. And, and then, and then, so that would be like thoracic rotation. Then I might have them keep the same prayer arms, um, put like a block between their knees with their feet all the way together and say, let your knees sway over to the right and let them sway over to the left. And of course, everyone wants to do the biggest movement possible. (laughs) Right. And, and I'll say, okay, but now here's the rule. The soles of your feet can't leave the ground. You can weight shift from outer to inner portions of your feet, but the soles of your feet can't leave the ground. So then that sort of forces them to move at their ankles a little more and at their, you know, pelvis a little bit more, uh, rather than just doing internal external rotation of their femurs, which is classical, you know, modern postural yoga, like huge end range of motion and internal external rotation of your femurs, mostly external. Um, and, uh, and then I would, I move into corrective exercises that I make up (laughs) or that I've learned somewhere that are pieces of say the, the classical asana that we're going to do later. So in Parvita Parjva Kanasana, you need a lot of lateral hip stability. Otherwise you're just gonna, you know, dump and, and have sort of like that Trendelenburg collapse. So we'll do some exercises that strengthen the gluteus medius um, and the obliques. Uh, and then, you know, I'll add in. So basically I build it. But I think what most yoga teachers do is they use a bunch of classical asanas to build into a harder classical asana. And I use a bunch of different um, interdisciplinary movements from, say, Pilates corrective exercise, Feldenkrais, um, Le Bon Bartenia, uh, myofascial release techniques to build into one yoga pose. Oh, I love it. So with all of that, because we are limited in audio and I I can just imagine that our listeners are wanting to do these things. Do you have (laughs) online videos where teachers from can connect with you? I do. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> Finally. I know. Like six years later, it was such a huge learning curve just to learn how to teach live, you know, and then I was like, okay, now I have to learn, figure out this online teaching thing. Um, I do. On my website, I have a, a course called Yoga Deconstructed, and it's in three parts. If you buy the whole thing, it's $60. If you buy it in parts, part one is 20, part two is 20, and part three is 30. So part one is a, a class very much like I would, I just described so you can experience what you would if you were to take a class with me here in LA um, or you know say a continuing ed type of thing and so is part two and then part three I work individually with a student and I uh, sort of deconstruct further some of the exercises that were deconstructions of a traditional asana. Um, and and then I show all kinds of options. Like if the person has this situation, I use this prop and change the exercise in this way. If the person has this type of situation, you know, I would do this. And so that's available on my website. And then I also teach classes for Jenny Rawlings um, online library. I have, I'm doing four for her and I have two that have posted so far. And then I have, if you want sort of more of just a theory, like the PowerPoint presentation behind what I'm doing. I mean, it's short. It's, it's definitely a very, um, condensed version of what I do. I just did a, a course for metaversity called realigning yoga with a, about eight other teachers. Yes. And that one you, you can get on my website too. I'm excited about that one. So. I signed up for it because I saw your post and I'm like, I'm going to get to playing all of them, but I have yet to get to yours. So I'm excited about that. I will put okay. links in the show notes for our listeners to to those if you want to send them along to me. And then yeah, to sort definitely. of summarize, so what I'm hearing you say is that we really, in our own practice and for our students, we need to be building in other movements other than just The traditional yoga, we could just teach traditional yoga. Is there anything else that teachers could look at? Like the biggest questions that I hear from from teachers is how do I not injure my students, especially when they become aware of how yoga can be part of that? Yeah, I think 
Uh, well, number one, there's no easy answer to that. I get asked the question all the time, what's the one anatomy sort of movement-based training I can take to, you know, not injure my students? And I'm like, oh, honey child. <laughs> you know, it's like when I think back to how I got to the point where I am today, I mean, it started, you know, gosh, like nine years ago taking a class called Anatomy and Clay where I basically just like cried through the whole thing because every we would we had to make every muscle out of clay and attach it to a skeleton and my <laughs> sartorius was like falling off and I couldn't twist the lat in the right way at the, you know um, and so you never ever stop learning and uh, and the beautiful wonderful thing about science is just when you think you know something um, it gets disproven and something else comes along which I think is awesome um, I have those experiences every day but I would say learning about your own body. So you can't really um, not injure your students unless you, I mean, uh, I mean, th there's, there's also this idea of there's a group class and there's privates. Right. And so when I finished my Pilates training, I was teaching, you know, seven privates a day, four to five days a week on the apparatus. I was seeing body after body after body, and, and I still do. I, I teach, um, you know, like around 15 privates a week, and I use the Pilates apparatus with every single client because there's closed chain feedback for your body and there's external load of spring resistance. And um, it's very hard with just a mat, a block, a blanket, a strap, a chair, a wall, a floor to um, map your body because um, there just aren't a ton of ways that you can provide the kind of feedback that you can, you know, say at the gym with different types of equipment or in the Pilates studio with all the different. Most people think there's just a reformer, but there's a reformer, a Cadillac, a one to chair, a spine corrector, a ladder barrel an arc better, a pedipole, a toe corrector, um, you know, it, it, it goes on and on, the spring tower, the jump board. Right, it's like its own gym. Right. And when I was a child, that was what I loved was the playground. And so when I no longer had recess in school, the gym became my playground. And I think not limiting yourself to your playground being just a mat, a block, a blanket, and a strap is going to blow open your movement paradigm. Right. To be able to, number one, be creative. Yeah. And number two, see how it's done in different fields. So in the physical therapy world, right, they're limited unless they, uh, like, there are many physical therapists that use, I mean, apparatus-based Pilates is basically the bastard stepchild between, you know, physical therapy and the gym. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> I love it. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's the missing link, in my opinion, um, because it's very hard to go from PT, where you're just doing, like, stretchy bands and clams, to back to the gym doing your Tabata and your right. <laughs> um, bar class and your, like, hardcore flow, sweaty flow, flow class. So my dream, you know, is, is that the, the work uh, of strengthening your joints from every single angle with lots of feedback and down regulation that's provided by the different pieces of Pilates apparatus becomes more mainstream because what I think what we love in the yoga world is the mindful movement and the calmness that we experience while we're moving. But what we're missing is, um, uh, is feedback for the whole back of your body, say, when you're lying on the carriage. Uh, you know, it's one thing in Tadasana for the teacher to say, ground through your feet into the floor and rise up through your spine out the crown of your head to the, the ceiling. It's another thing to lie on the reformer, have your feet on the foot bars, have this spring resistance, so you get this um, sort of, you know, the springs to me are like the, the fascial recoil that's externalized from your body, right? And then there's the fascial recoil that's in internal to your body and so when you push out right you get the feedback of the shoulder rest hops of your shoulders um you know you feel the glide of the carriage and you do you actually feel the grounding through your feet and the lengthening through your crown but you're not just standing there doing an isometric like different isometric contractions if that makes yes, sense yes it does it does
I love it. I feel like I need to take a Pilates class or someone has. <laughs> I like how you <sighs> said that it's like recess and like playground equipment. It That's is. Helping me it's a little so much bit fun. With my fear it's so much gym. fun. <laughs> it is so much fun. Tell us yeah. Where people can find you uh, because you do a lot of travel and teaching. Yeah. Um, well, everything is listed on my website, which is just my name, trinaaltman.com. Um, coming up, I'm going to be in Austin, uh, not this weekend, but next weekend. And I'm teaching, where else? Toronto this fall, Portland. Um, Did I see Spain? Well, Spain on your list? Oh, Trinidad, which is the Caribbean. Yes. Oh, <laughs> and Oh, uh, may, yeah, Trinidad is uh, Caribbean. Is that the one you're talking mm. about? And next June, maybe. Um, there was quite a and list. then I, <laughs> um, yeah, and and uh, and then I'm here in LA. You know, so if you come visit LA, I can always have free guests to my um, Equinox classes, and then I teach at the Moving Joint. All my privates and um, my reformer Pilates deconstructed reformer class. So, but yes, I'm all, I'm in, I'm easily, uh, easy to be found on Facebook and, and Instagram and, and on my website. Yeah, well, I love following your videos on Instagram and Facebook. So I'll definitely um, put a link to those for, for our teachers that are listening. Do you have anything to kind of close out for the teachers that are feeling, oh my gosh, I do not want to like the fear coming up, I don't want to injure my students. You touched on a little bit when you said right. we're always just learning more things, but anything on that line? Um, well, I think it's kind of in, impossible in a sense, right? Like you can injure yourself. My husband is a doctor and he like busted his eardrum with a Q-tip once, you know? Right. <laughs> Our living with fear or teaching with fear, that comes out um, to your students. And I think the biggest gift uh, I have like four principles that I, movement principles that I always use to guide me when I teach. And the fourth one is, it's uh, it's like T-U-R-E. The fourth one is E and it stands for creating an environment of safety. So meaning bringing awareness to your body rather than being overly concerned with the performance itself. Um, and, you know, that's, it's not always the case. I mean, for somebody like me who's hypermobile, you know, Stretching into like crazy end ranges of motion never felt like a stretch to me. That was just like no different than, you know, you're reaching your arm out in front of you and grabbing the steering wheel. Mm -hmm. And and I think just giving yourself permission to, first of all, um, I think in a private, you can definitely um, not injure your students because there's dialogue and um, and that's what the, they're paying for, right, is uh, is communication, one-on-one attention. Um, But in a group class, there needs to be the personal responsibility. Like I don't blame any of the teachers and any of the group classes that I was in for years and years for not walking up to me and saying like, Instead of, oh, awesome, I love, you know, you're, you're so good at this pose saying, uh, you know, maybe this isn't such a good idea. You seem to be very hypermobile and, you know, maybe you should. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I don't, I don't blame them. Like, that's not their job. It's just, it's not. Um, in a private session, yes. In a group class, no. And I think that there needs to be, because people are like, oh, well, you know, this person has arthritis or scoliosis. So what should I do? And, you know, what's okay and what's not okay? That's treating them as a diagnosis and not as a person because everybody's scoliosis is different. Um, Everybody's, you know, background and athletic abilities of what they've been doing with the scoliosis in their body before they come to you is different. Mm -hmm. Um, And so the critical thinking when I teach my trainings, it often, you know, people kind of freak out. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance when I say there is no one answer. Like it it would be like if a teacher was like, oh, Trina's hypermobile. So this is, these are the rules. It's like, well, the rules were very different two years ago than they are now. Exactly. For me. Yeah. Because of all the weight training and stability um, that I've done in the last four years. So what may have injured me then is very different than what might injure me now. And you can only um, take on that kind of responsibility, I think, 
if you're working one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, that is so key. And that, you know, as long as we're conveying that to our students when they come and show up for a group class and we keep putting the responsibility over to them, I love that. And more and more I teach private classes because of this, because I feel like mm -hmm. I have no idea what's going on with everyone. When I teach one-on-one, -on -one, I can say, how is that feeling? And just check in, yes. check in, check in. And I think that it, teachers need to take private. So every time I teach a training, I say, raise your hand if you have taken private lessons. And um, in the yoga space, it's usually nobody. And in the Pilates space, it's almost everyone. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and because that's how Pilates is structured. You're not allowed to take a group reformer class unless you've had a certain number of privates and the teacher feels that you understand the basics enough to be in a group setting. Mm -hmm. Same thing when I took a hypopressives training. There was, mm -hmm. You cannot teach group classes right away. You have to start working one-on-one -on -one with people. So interesting. Yeah. So what are the other three things? You said that we covered E. What is TRU then? Oh, uh, T is for total embodiment. Um, and I came up with this because I, I was very frustrated, you know, as a artist and a very visual person, a, you know, background in fashion design and textile design, jewelry design. I really didn't like walkie talkie teachers. <laughs> Meaning, you know, you go to a Pilates mat class or you go to, um, you know, yoga class and the teacher would just walk around and talk and <laughs> there was no visual anything. And so total embodiment, we need to address that everyone learns in different ways. So you should show the pose or the exercise and also with the caveat of like, this is how it looks in my body. It doesn't mean it's going to look like this or should look like this in your body, but just like, here's a visual reference. Um, so you're not totally lost. Uh, and so seeing the exercise, hearing the cues, experiencing proprioception and experiencing interoception. Uh, because I think a lot of times we cue with either anatomy or imagery. Mm -hmm. And very few people, I know I didn't understand either language. <laughs> I didn't. I was like, I don't know what spread your collarbones means. And I don't know what like spiral your thighs or spiral your legs mean. Right. Like I didn't understand the imagery and I didn't understand the anatomy because I didn't know where bones were. And uh, if you are teaching, you know, with the visual, the auditory, and then also the proprioception. So I would say, um, you know, the kinesthetic feedback of, of like using therapy balls at the beginning of a class um, or touching yourself, like having your student actually touch their left scapula as they move their left arm. Um, and then the interoception, which is just taking the time to, which yoga is so well known for and, and, and good, you know, the sensing your breath, sensing your heart's pace, sensing the texture of the air on your skin, sensing, you know, how it feels in your hamstrings when you're doing a, a bridge uh, so that you know where your hamstrings are. Mm -hmm. Um, that's T. You really want me to keep going? <laughs> I do. I would love, okay. I would love to hear the other two. So U is understanding the underlayer. Um, and, and that is um, tracking. So in somatic psychotherapy, tracking is often like you'll sit in a chair with your feet on the floor and just focus on how it feels to have your feet on the floor and the support of the floor under your feet and if it is grounding you. Um, and so say in a yoga or a Pilates class, um, you know, trying to sense, say, the movement of your femur in your hip socket, which is really hard because if you don't know where your hip socket is, which I didn't, um, <laughs> you can't track that. So, so bringing that in, like say, okay, take, see where your pubic bone is, you know, go like two inches to the left and believe it or not, like that's where your hip socket is. Oh my gosh. Okay. Let's lie on our back and keep our pelvis steady and just move your leg and see if you can sense that like that's your hip socket before, you know, doing like normal stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and then the R is, is regress to progress. So uh, creating corrective exercises to assist 
students in performing more challenging exercises, um, meaning like, say, a, a challenging pose like side plank is going to require, you know, full end range of motion and extension at your wrist, uh, you know, centration of the glenohumeral joint, um, stability at the scapula thoracic joint, awareness and uh, of where your ribs are in space and where your pelvis is in space, um, a lot of strength in the, the lateral hips, stability through the ankles. So, you know, you uh, I can think of like, you know, 15 exercises right now for all of those like five categories that I would want to teach before I even had them do a side plank. Right. And then, and then it's like, you know what, whichever one was the most challenging for you, do that one instead of the side plank, like don't hurt your wrist, <laughs> right? right. <laughs> because you don't need to be like, I always, I, I always hated when it, the teacher would say, you know, take, I understood why they would say, if, if this is too hard, do child's pose and, and child's <laughs> pose is lovely. But when I went to physical therapy, I was like, wow, I was really kind of wasting my time. Like instead of child's pose, I could have been doing all these PT exercises to actually build up strength to be able to be on my hands and knees again without wrist pain rather than just bypassing the issue and and not addressing it. That is such a good point. Always looking at, you know, what what are we looking for in this pose? What what benefits do we get? How else can we get it in a different way? I love that. Yeah, and physical therapy, you know, you get homework, and it's not fun to do by yourself. So I think what a lot of my students really appreciate is we're doing a lot of physical therapy exercises in the group class, mm-hmm. um, and they're they're graded. So the very first one, I would say, like, okay, this was the very first thing I got for my shoulder when I was cleared out of the acute pain phase to start exercise. And so this is our first pose of the day. And then from there, you know, I would either add load, add a longer lever, add an increased range of motion, um, all of these different factors that you learn about in the Metaversity course. And people could stop where they needed to stop. So maybe they just were doing the one at the very beginning, or maybe they were doing the second one, but not the third one. But everyone has something to do. But it's not like, um, if you can't do this, do this. Right. It's like, we're just all on this journey, and we're going to walk you know, 10,000 miles. And today, you might walk 10, and, and Susan he might walk one, you know, and it doesn't matter. The, the view is just as beautiful. Like there's grass and trees and flowers everywhere. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it doesn't matter how far you go. The, the, the grass and the trees and the flowers are everywhere. Well, and the other thing is kind of backing that up a little bit. I noticed with myself, say, for instance, in tree pose, really simple pose from doing lots of tree pose in the quote unquote traditional way. I find that if I lower my foot down below my knee, it's actually much yep more challenging it's for me so much harder <laughs> yes <laughs> but it, we kind of say like oh do this baby step this yep. one this one and I think well for my body this one mm-hmm. is challenging yeah and then you know taking the foot and hovering it one inch away from your your lower leg is going to be harder than putting your foot on your lower leg because it's an open chain versus a closed chain exactly oh so much good stuff here thank you <laughs> Trina this is oh thank this you this is getting me excited about looking at your course because I've already signed up for the metaversity one but also looking at this this uh, yoga deconstructed course so I'll definitely put a link in the show notes for that and if there's anything else that you have you can send it along to us i will thank you so much shannon it's been a pleasure and i'm just uh, so grateful to have connected with you thanks for sharing this with us and also huge huge gratitude for you know no shame in this like you said we're moving forward together in this we're learning all the time and yeah so thank you Thank you. Alrighty, Connected Yoga teachers, so much information here. I am looking at my own practice after today's episode with Trina, looking at how I can add in lifting, pushing, pulling, and walking on uneven surfaces. And as Trina said, not limiting the playground, to just a mat, block, strap. So let's see if we can share in the Connected Yoga Teacher Facebook group how we're adding in that variety and that variability. For sure, check out some 
some of Trina's videos online. Also, if you're really interested in this strengthening, adding a little more strength into your practice, you might go back and listen to episode 32 with Catherine Bruni Young. She really shares a new perspective on that as well and talks about how we can do that strengthening at home. I really want to underline what Trina said today, that it's important for us to learn about our own body and to really also start to look at this as a way to train. So Trina talked about the importance of one-on-one, either taking one-on-one classes with a yoga teacher. So just imagine for a moment that you carve out some time for yourself to either reach out to a local yoga teacher or reach out to a teacher who is online and you reach out to them and let them know that you want to either schedule one or maybe one package of their yoga private one classes. This is a whole other level of taking a, a different approach to training. So you really get to know your own body, you're serving yourself, but you're also serving your students as well. And just stepping back, and this is this is from my own experience in this, is stepping back and feeling like I am worth this time. And it is worth it for me to figure out what's going on in my body and how can I move in new ways, what movements are not great for my body. And I have learned mostly through working with a physiotherapist, uh, really some key insights to my own body and then also being able to help students with that as well. I'd also like to just reiterate what Trina said in flipping around this idea about group classes versus private one-on-one classes when we're teaching them. So often I hear 200 hour yoga teachers saying, when I get a little bit more training, I can move from teaching group classes to teaching private classes. And I'm really of a different mindset now since I took a hypopressive training with Trista Zinn. And then Trina said it again. She added that there's a real piece of being able to see this person as an individual in front of us and being able to hear the dialogue back and forth from this person and how that can really help to decrease the injuries that we're seeing in yoga students. So in a group class, everyone's moving together. Some are moving because they they think they should. Some are not quite in tune with how that's feeling in the body or all kinds of things are going on in a group class. But when you're working one-on-one, you really have that space to say to someone, how is that feeling? Or look at their face and really notice, ah, they're struggling with that. So for all of you who are 200 hour yoga teachers or beyond, and if you're feeling like I don't have enough training right now to offer private yoga classes, I would really challenge you to step outside of that mindset and to think that when you go and meet with that person and work one-on-one, you hear their struggles, anything that you're not sure about, it's okay to say, I don't know, let me look into that and get back to you on that next week. I know you guys, and I know that you're going to go home, really do your research, find out what movements would be beneficial and dig in. So I would say go for it. Teach the private one-on-one classes and group classes are very challenging. If you're already teaching group classes, you can definitely teach a private class. I also love how Trina said to look at your students as an individual and not as a diagnosis. So for example, if a student comes to you with scoliosis, you're not going to create a yoga flow and then replicate that for every person with scoliosis. It's really about that individual person. Sure, we can find some things that overall this pose might help with that, but we're really working with an individual. One key takeaway that I'm actually going to add to my own yoga classes is to to do some more visual demos. So I got away from this. I really practiced and worked on my cues and I'm going to step back into doing some more visual demos where I feel it would add value. So I love that Trina challenged even that. Uh, I worked so hard to use my cues. And so it's not, it's not like all the time. Is that the best way to go? Already connected yoga teachers, so much to think on. I'm excited to hear your comments about this. So leave them in the comments on our show notes. In the show notes, Laura has compiled all the show notes and links. So it's all ready and there for you. I will see you here at the same time next week. Take care, connected yoga teachers. Share the yoga that lights you up. 